Hello, friends. Welcome to video number 13 in our National Park Mystery Series. Going out into the great outdoors can be wonderful for both our physical and mental health. Every country across the world has at least some beautiful scenery that is worth walking for, but sometimes hikers pay the ultimate price for beautiful view. Remember, never hike alone, tell someone where you're going, and always take a GPS tracker and adequate supplies. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the stories. First up, we have Matthew Jedediah Hall. October 29th, 2020 should have been Matthew Jed Hall's 19th birthday. A day that should have been spent celebrating with friends and family was instead a somber occasion. On January 22nd, 2018, 16-year-old Jed left his home in Idaho Falls at around 2 a.m. and hopped into his 2009 Nissan Versa, equipped with camping and survival gear, along with a 9mm handgun. Before leaving, he left his parents a note telling them he was going to take his own life, and just like that, he disappeared into the darkness. When Jed's parents woke up the next morning and went to the bedroom to check on him, they were heartbroken to see that his bedroom was empty and that the note lay on his desk. After reading the contents of that note, his parents rushed to the nearest phone and reported him missing to the Idaho Falls Police Department. Soon, a wide-scale search is underway with his parents, Amy and Alan, joining in. Alan told East Idaho News, It was black madness. It was just insanity. No lead, nothing. Just all of a sudden, he's gone. Jed's parents continued driving up and down the highways looking for any sign of him, while the police began pinging his phone, hoping to get a last known location. Jed's phone pinged for a final time at 6.48 a.m. near the interchange of Interstate 15, and U.S. Highway 20 along the Snake River. After that, the signal went dead. Meanwhile, staff at the American Heritage Charter School began arriving, ready to face another day. One teacher noticed that a window had been broken and began looking through the CCTV footage from the night before. As they scanned through hours of footage, something finally caught their eye at 2.31 a.m. The video showed Jed breaking a window and gaining entry to the school wearing combat boots, knee pads, as well as ear and eye protection. Nothing was taken from the school, but instead, Jed made his way to the locker of the girl who had just rejected his advances and slipped $1,000 in cash, a necklace, and a note into her locker. Once he was finished, he slipped out of the school, got back into his car, and disappeared into the darkness once more. The few hours between entering the school and his phone going dead have not been accounted for. Interestingly, most sources state that Jed left behind a journal where his car had been parked at home. Inside the journal were lists of things he was going to take with him and plans for disguises. Was the note a red herring, or did Jed really intend on taking his own life that night? His family and friends said he loved the show Hunted and was in the Civil Air Patrol and wanted to join the military after school. Despite huge search efforts, not a single sign of Jed has ever been found. And after the investigation dwindled, Jed's parents called in the help of a private investigator, Jim Terry. In an interview with the East Idaho News in April of 2020, Jim put forward some very bizarre theories that both the Idaho Falls Police and Jed's parents seemed to disagree with. Jim alleges that Jed had a female friend who had been assaulted and that Jed wanted to get his revenge and stand up for her. The details surrounding this seem rather thin, and this article details how there was a shooting on the night that Jed disappeared that took place on the driveway of a person who may have known Jed's female friend. Jed's parents rebutted this theory and said, Jed was skilled enough that if he wanted to hurt somebody, in the technical and tactical sense, that wouldn't have been something he wasn't capable of. He wouldn't have done it. I don't believe he would have done it. But his ability, he was a pretty well-trained kid. Since the early morning hours of January 22, 2018, Jed Hall has never been seen or heard from again. His family are extremely concerned for his welfare and are offering a $20,000 reward for any information. Jed Hall is described as a white male with brown hair and brown hazel eyes, 5'11", 120 pounds. In a Facebook post to the page Missing Jed Hall, his family wrote, 31 months gone. $20,000 reward for information leading to finding my son or for information helping me find the Nissan Versa he took. Missing all that time, we won't ever get back. Such a huge hole in our hearts and lives. Anyone with any information about Jed is asked to contact Detective Anthony Cox of the Idaho Falls Police Department at 
612-8616 and reference case number 2018-026336. Maximilian Schweitzer. The disappearance of Max Schweitzer is both intriguing and confusing, and there are so few details available about his background or his disappearance. According to the website, strangeoutdoors.com, Max's LinkedIn profile listed him as a clandestine analyst at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. While his profile is no longer active, various sources mention that he also worked for the San Francisco Civil Service Commission as a transit planner and that this employment was terminated in 2004. Now, the Web Sleuths Forum is filled with theories and ideas about this case. However, without much solid information, these ideas and theory remain just that. In 2005, Max faced federal charges for vandalizing an FBI lobby in San Francisco after he demanded to speak with FBI agents. The article by the San Francisco Gate states that he threw a plant against the wall, broke the legs off chairs, and damaged glass display cases. The FBI alleged that he caused $7,491 in damages. It's unclear whether Max damaged the lobby because he was told he couldn't meet with agents or whether he just had a sudden outburst. There isn't much follow-up information available about this incident. However, Strange Outdoors also uncovered that in 2016, Max was arrested again under charges of threats of violence, annoying and obscene threatening phone calls, threatening state officials or judges, and warrants or holds only. The main question is, why was Max so insistent on speaking to FBI agents and judges and state officials? Did he really have ties to Homeland Security? Or was this just something he had popped onto his LinkedIn profile? The only details surrounding his disappearance are as follows. Somewhere around January 1st to January 5th, Max entered the Yosemite National Park and left his car at the Camp 4 parking lot. On January 5th, the rental company that Max had rented the car from reported that the car was overdue and subsequently it was located in the Camp 4 lot, but there was no sign of Max. Yosemite National Park Service issued a tweet on January 6, 2018, alerting the public to Max's disappearance. At this time, Max had already been reported missing and an investigation was underway. As previously mentioned, the details surrounding his disappearance are incredibly sparse and there are no mentions of any searches that were conducted. The tweet by the Yosemite NPS reads, Missing Person, Max Schweitzer, 41-year-old white male, brown hair, blue eyes, 5 foot 8 inches tall, 185 pounds. Unknown clothing, gear unknown, unknown direction of travel. Now, as of 2022, Max still remains missing. With his possible ties to Homeland Security, is it possible that Max didn't disappear at all and was sent on a secret mission? Or is there something more nefarious at hand? Anyone with any information regarding Max is asked to contact the Yosemite National Park Service at 209 379 1992. Next up, David Cook. On September 19th, 2016, David Dave Cook entered the White River National Forest in Aspen, Colorado, and planned on hiking to Maroon Bells and Pyramid Peak alone. Dave was a former Marine and had gone on plenty of hikes before, so he was well equipped for this trip. In fact, this hike was to be his 47th summit of a 14er, and Dave was excited to get his trip underway. Unfortunately, however, Dave failed to return home after his trip, and his family immediately knew that something was wrong. Dave was described by his wife, Maureen, as a kind and caring person who wouldn't just leave his family. The Maroon Bells consist of two peaks, Maroon Peak, which is 14,163 feet tall, and North Maroon Peak, which is 14,019 feet tall. The Pyramid Peak is also a similar height at 14,025 feet. And as Dave was a former Marine and had done 46 summits before, neither he nor his family was too worried. However, the Maroon Bells have picked up the unfortunate nickname of the Deadly Bells over the years, and it appears that the Deadly Bells may have indeed claimed another victim. According to reports, Dave entered the White River National Forest on September 19, 2016, and planned to climb North Maroon Peak first. Park rangers and records indicate that Dave arrived at the park at around 11 a.m. and set off on his solo hike. There was no indication that anything was wrong, and Dave carried on throughout the day. Other hikers also reported seeing him on South Maroon at around 1.40 p.m. on September 19th of 2016. The next known movements are between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., 
when Dave's phone pinged from inside the park. Unfortunately, investigators were not able to determine which peak the ping had come from. Then, on September 20th, 2016, a day after Dave had entered the park, a parking attendant recalls seeing Dave that morning. This is the last confirmed sighting of Dave Cook, and ever since that day, September 20th, 2016, there has been no sign of him. Dave had only planned to be gone for a few days, so when he failed to return home, his wife knew immediately that something was very, very wrong. When she was unable to get a hold of him, she called the park rangers and contacted the Pitkin County Sheriff's Office to report her husband missing. The Pitkin County Sheriff's Office sprang into action and began their search for Dave on foot and by air. Mountain Rescue Aspen, an all-volunteer, non-profit organization, also joined in for the search, utilizing the tools and expertise they had at hand. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, no sign of Dave could be located, and the search was called off after a few days due to bad weather and heavy snowfall. Investigators later searched Dave's car for any clues and found that his map for Pyramid Peak was still in his car. According to the Facebook page, Find Dave Cook, his map for Pyramid Peak was still in the car, although perhaps he just forgot the map. Dave did not have his crampons with him, but he did have microspikes. Search and Rescue and the Pitkin County Sheriff's Office did a good job searching. There were multiple helicopters, boots on the ground, a plane with a million-dollar camera, and sniffer dogs used in the search. Unfortunately, even with all this high technology at their disposal, the Pitkin County Sheriff's Office and Search and Rescue teams have been unable to find any trace of Dave. Over the years, multiple additional searches have been conducted, and the Pitkin County Sheriff's Office has made it clear that they have not given up in their search for the remains of Dave. In the wake of Dave's mysterious disappearance, Maureen, Dave's wife, along with members of Dave's family, set up the Dave Gives Back campaign to help raise funds and awareness for search and rescue teams in both Colorado and New Mexico. Maureen wants to ensure that Dave is not forgotten and that other families do not have to endure the same ordeal. 49-year-old Dave Cook was last seen in the White River National Forest on September 20, 2016. He was last seen wearing khaki pants, a long-sleeved black shirt, a blue helmet, and possibly a gray jacket. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Pitkin County Sheriff's Office at 970-920-5300. Next up, we have Breck Phelps. There's a distinct lack of information in the case of 68-year-old Breck Phelps, but here's what we do know. On October 2nd, 2016, Breck went on a fishing trip on the Stanislaw River in the Stanislaw National Forest in Tuolumne County, California. Unfortunately, Breck never returned to the shore and has been missing ever since. According to reports, Breck's friend found his 2007 Nissan Versa parked along Highway 108, close to the Donnell Vista Point. The Donnell Vista Point is a trail in the Stanislaw National Forest that gives way to some of the most beautiful views in the park. According to StrangeOutdoors.com, the tract of land around Donnell Point is described as large and vast with extreme changes in elevation, deep canyons with heavy foliage, and cold, fast-running water that filled crevices and ledges. This was the trail Breck used in order to get to the Stanislaus River. When Breck's friends and family realized he was missing, they continued the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Office, who embarked on an intensive search for him. Using helicopters, sniffer dogs, and officers on the ground and in the water, the Sheriff's Office and search and rescue team searched for Breck, but found no sign of him. The Stanislaus River and other pockets of water were searched extensively as well, but there was no sign of him ever found there. There have been two other mysterious disappearances in Donnell Vista over the years, and they are cases that will be featured later on in this video. 68-year-old Breck Phelps was last seen on October 2, 2016, near the Stanislaw River in the Stanislaw National Forest in California. He is described as a white male with gray hair, blue eyes, standing 5 foot 10 inches tall and weighing about 175 pounds. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Office at 209-533-5815. Next up, we have the case of Patricia Sue Tolhurst. 48-year-old Patricia Sue Tolhurst also mysteriously disappeared from Donnell Vista in Stanislaus National Forest in California. 
Again, there's not much information available, but here is what we do know. 48-year-old Patricia owned the Patty Shack restaurant in East Sonora and was known as a kind and loving person. Unfortunately, shortly before her disappearance, Patty had been going through some financial hardships and it had taken a toll on her. She was stressed out and was hoping that things would settle down and sort themselves out. The last confirmed sighting of Patricia was on April 18, 2014, in Twain Heart, California, and while this was the last time she was seen, it wasn't the last time that her loved ones heard from her. On April 20, 2014, Patricia posted a letter to her friends, telling them that she was going to Kennedy Meadows along the Pacific Crest Trail Desert. This area is called the Promised Land, as hikers have to hike over 700 miles to reach this beautiful spot. In the letter, Patricia told her friends that she was going to put her feet in the water, and many hikers talk about the magnificent waters at Kennedy Meadows. After this, Patricia has never been seen or heard from again. When Patricia failed to make contact with friends and family, the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Office was made aware of her disappearance and began their search for her. It would take two days for the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Office to find their first clue. On April 22nd, Patricia's white Toyota 4Runner was found alongside Highway 108 at Donnell Vista Point. Inside was her handbag and other personal items. There was no indication of where Patricia could have gone, and the Sheriff's Office continued their search in the surrounding areas. Unfortunately, these searches have turned up nothing. As of 2022, Patricia remains missing. Patricia Sue Tolhurst was last seen on April 18th, 2014, in Twain Heart, California. She is described as a white female with blonde hair, blue eyes, stands around 5'7 to 5'8 inches tall, and at the time of her disappearance weighed 120 to 130 pounds. She has a scar in her ankle and a scar on her left cheek that looks like a dimple. She was last seen wearing a black pullover top, blue jeans, a brown leather necklace with a charm, and a California State University 2006 class ring. Anyone with any information is asked to contact the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Office at 209-533-5855 and reference case C14-1184. Next up, Brian George Brunel. 48-year-old Brian George Brunel was last seen on October 31st, Halloween, 2011, at his sister's home in Pleasant Hill, California. The details surrounding Brian's case are incredibly limited, and all we know is that prior to his disappearance, Brian had been depressed about being out of work and also had financial worries. After leaving his sister's home, Brian simply dropped off the face of the earth, and it wouldn't be until two weeks later that the Pleasant Hill Police Department would get their first clue. On November 15, 2011, Brian's abandoned car was found at the Boulder Creek Falls Trailhead in the Whiskey Town National Recreation Area by staff. Following this development, the National Park Service Rangers, the Shasta County Sheriff's Department, the Shasta County Search and Rescue Teams, and the California Highway Patrol began their search for Brian on foot and by air. These teams scoured the woods surrounding Mill Creek and Boulder Creek but unfortunately, there was no sign of Brian. After November 17, 2011, the search was scaled back and has been quietly ongoing ever since. Brian George Brunel was last seen on October 31, 2011 in Pleasant Hill, California. He is described as a white male, 5 foot 9 inches tall, with brown hair and brown eyes. Anyone with any information as to his whereabouts is asked to please contact the Pleasant Hill Police Department at 925- 288-4600 and reference case number 114267. Next, David Michael Burney. On June 29, 2007, 46-year-old David Michael Burney purchased a red Toyota Tercel and planned to drive to Georgia to meet up with his two daughters. Unfortunately, David never arrived, prompting his daughters to report him missing. As with most cases featured in this episode, there's not a whole lot of information, and all we can do is report the facts that are presented to us. The next update on David's case doesn't come until late August of 2007, when his new red Toyota Tercel was found abandoned in Bankhead Forest, just off County Road B-15 in Winston County, Alabama. 
After talking to locals, the Coleman County Sheriff's Office learned that David had last been seen at the Jet Pep gas station on Highway 157 in Battleground, Alabama on June 29, 2007. After that, David seems to have just disappeared and has not been seen or heard from since. According to locals, David's car may have been there since July 7, 2007 and wasn't reported or properly noted until over a month later. According to the Charlie Project, the red Toyota Tercel was out of gas and the battery was missing. But apart from that, there was no signs of a struggle or any indication that anything untoward had happened. Sadly, David left behind six children and other family members who are all desperate for answers. His profile on the Charlie Project reads, David's mother, sister, and six children all stated he would not have left of his own accord, and they think he may have met with foul play. They stated he had enemies who could have harmed him. David Michael Burney, as we said, was last seen at the Jet Pep gas station on Highway 157 in Battleground, Alabama. He is described as a white male with graying brown hair, brown hazel eyes, stands 5'4 to 5'7, and weighs between 155 to 165 pounds. David has several tattoos on his right arm, a scar on his right arm, and a brown birthmark on the front of his neck underneath his chin. He's also missing several teeth. Anyone with information is asked to please contact Ronnie Melton, the captain of investigations with the Coleman County Sheriff's Office at 256-734-0342 and reference case 708-00091. Next, the disappearance of Nita Mayo. 64-year-old Nita Mayo was a hard-working and loving woman who cared for not just her family, but others during their time of need. Nita worked as a licensed practical nurse, or LPN, at Mount Grant General Hospital Clinic in Hawthorne, Nevada, and everyone who met her simply adored her. Nita also loved the great outdoors and loved to drive into nature and explore. Her daughter, Tracy, told Colo TV, Getting to know all parts of the United States was something she enjoyed, and she loved scenery. She was always putting us in the car and just driving to discover things. On August 8, 2005, Nita hopped into her silver 1997 Mercury Sable and headed for Sonora, California to do a bit of shopping. Nita had the day off work, so she met up with a friend to have breakfast, and by 11 a.m., the two were done, and Nita was on her way to California. Nita was excited about her trip as it would take her over the Sonora Pass, a beautiful mountain road in California. The road is only open at certain times of the year due to the weather, and lucky for Nita, it was open in August of 2005. When Nita failed to show up for work on August 9, 2005, however, her co-workers knew that something was very, very wrong. Nita was dedicated to her job and was considered a dependable and well-respected nurse. It was extremely out of character for her to not show up to work without even calling in. When her colleagues tried to call her home and received no answer, they called Nita's next of kin, her children, to inform them that they had been unable to make contact with their mother. After hearing this news, her four children made the decision to report their mother missing, and soon County Sheriff's Office launched an investigation. Her children were concerned that she may have had an accident on the road between Hawthorne and Sonora, Despite lengthy searches throughout the day and night, no sign of Nita was found. Then, just two days after she mysteriously disappeared, a shocking discovery was made. On August 10, 2005, Nita's 1997 Silver Mercury Sable was discovered in the parking lot at Donnell's Vista in the Stanislaw National Forest. Part of this area is a lookout over Route 108 that Nita would have driven down to get to and from Sonora and Hawthorne. Bizarrely, her car was found locked with her keys, handbag, purse, ID, and phone all neatly tucked away inside. There were other items in the car. The only thing that was missing was the camera that she had taken with her to take pictures of her trip. Despite numerous searches from both the air and on the ground, no sign of Nita Mayo has ever been discovered. Sniffer dogs were brought in. However, they were unable to follow her scent for more than a few yards. According to the Charlie Project, Jewel Jean Rice was mentioned in connection with Nita's case. On Nita's Charlie Project profile, it reads, In September 2005, authorities announced they were seeking Jewel Jean Rice in connection with Mayo's disappearance. 
She's not being called a suspect in Nita's case, but investigators believe that she's a person of interest and may have some valuable information. Police stated Rice's vehicle had mechanical problems in the Sonora era on the day Nita disappeared, and she was going around asking people for help. Despite all this information and developments, however, the police are still no closer to solving the mystery of what happened to Nita Mayo on that sunny August afternoon. Nita was last seen in Hawthorne, Nevada on August 8, 2005. She speaks with a British accent, although the particular accent is not specified as there are actually hundreds of British accents, and she is a British national. She is described as a white female with brown hair, brown hazel eyes, around five foot tall, and 140 pounds. Nita wears oval-shaped prescription glasses with gold wire frames and has her ears pierced. She was last seen wearing a gold mother's ring with a pear dot, pink stone, a blue stone, and a purple stone on her right ring finger and possibly a Celtic-style silver necklace and a silver-style necklace with one blue and two pink stones and a small pendant. Anyone with any information is urged to contact the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Office on 800-228-3592 and reference case 05-2406. And lastly, we have the disappearance of Patrick Terrence Whalen. 33-year-old Patrick Terrence Whalen was described by those who knew him best as warm-spirited and kind-hearted. Patrick was training to become a naturopath doctor and had recently finished his bachelor's degree. According to sources, he worked extensively with charities, raising money for cystic fibrosis research and dedicated his time to those in need. When Patrick wasn't looking after the underdog or studying hard for his degree, he could be found hiking in the wilderness. In fact, his friends and family jokingly called him the survivalist, thanks to his many hours and hundreds of miles along the Pacific Crest Trail and in the Glacier National Park, the Blackfeet Tribal Lands, and the Columbia Falls region of Montana. Patrick was well-versed in the outdoors and believed that nature had a way of healing us. The last time Patrick was seen or heard from was on November 2, 2000, when he was in Glacier Park in Montana. As previously mentioned, Patrick had been spending a lot of time in Glacier Park and other national parks and forests in the area. Reports do not give an exact date, however, but sometime after November 2nd, Patrick's car was found abandoned at the Lake McDonald Lodge restaurant on the U.S. Highway 89 and State Highway 49 towards the eastern edge of Glacier National Park. It wouldn't be until May 27, 2001 that investigators would get their next big clue when they found an abandoned camp that Patrick had made. The camp was found at the Atlantic Creek Backcountry Campground along the North Fork of Cutbank Creek near Bad Marriage Mountain and Medicine Grizzly Peak. Park rangers were able to make an identification quickly as Patrick's personal items had been left behind. However, there was no sign of Patrick. Reports don't indicate how long the camp had been there or how long Patrick had been gone from the camp. By this point, Patrick's family knew that something terrible must have happened to him. They consider him a true survivalist in every sense of the word, and he had a kind heart, so it was very unlike him not to make contact with friends or family or to just miss his classes. Unfortunately, extensive searches of all the areas mentioned previously have turned up nothing. However, his family are still holding out hope that one day Patrick will walk through the front door and that they will be reunited again. In 2008, his family held a vigil in honor of his memory and since then have continued fighting for answers. Patrick Terrence Whalen was last seen on November 2, 2000 in Glacier Park, Montana. He was originally from Cleveland, Ohio, but was living in Portland, Oregon at the time of his disappearance. Patrick is described as a white male with blonde hair, hazel eyes. He stood six feet tall and weighed about 155 pounds. The Charlie Project notes, according to his family, Patrick was displaying signs of mental illness, including obsessive behavior and paranoia at the time of his disappearance. He may have been wearing a short sleeve shirt and blue jeans, and he also wore wireframe glasses. Anyone with any information is asked to contact Park Ranger Joe Fowler at Glacier National Park at 406-732-7700 and reference case 06-0401-MIP or the Glacier County Sheriff's Office at 406-873-2711. Well, folks, there you have it. What did you think of these strange disappearances? 
I look forward to your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. In the meanwhile, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you just a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.